Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Game Potato Comp video, we're going to be discussing Intel and NVIDIA, specifically the pricing for the GTX 1050 Ti and the regular plain old G uh, 1050. And then we're going to be going through some leaks on the upcoming Kaby Lake series from Intel, which would include some images and some further specifications of the CPU. But first things first, NVIDIA. Since this is the quickest of the two to discuss, let's get the fast one out of the way first. So, the GTX 1050 and the 1050 Ti are going to be released on October the 25th. Just to clarify, that would be both cards. Both are going to be targeting 75 watt TDP, which is pretty excellent. It means they're going to be um, able to be powered simply via, via excuse me, a PCIe slot. Now, there is obviously... A clear line in the sand between the cards. In this case, you're looking at 128 fewer CUDA cores, so the disparity is 768 versus 640 and half the amount of memory. But the pleasant thing is the pricing. The 1050 is going to just cost 109 US dollars, according to videocards.com leak, whereas the 1050 Ti is going to cost just 139. This is actually a pretty nice price to say the least and now as one can imagine there's already various leaks popping out from various uh, cards but it looks like you're going to be looking at a base clock of around just a smidgen under 1300 megahertz for the 1050 tie and it's going to boost up to about 1400 megahertz now for the pricing considering that this card going by the previous uh, leaks which have happened regarding the performance is going to be roughly and i say roughly because they seem to be trading on various benchmarks, roughly the performance of a GTX 960. You look at a card which is going to be pretty great for MOBAs. It's going to do for light gaming. I mean, you're going to be able to play games like Gears of War, but not at the highest visual quality. It's going to be perfect for games like, let's say, World of Warcraft, um, as I've mentioned, MOBAs, Counter-Strike. And so I do have a feeling that this card is going to be very popular for SFF, small form factor PCs. And naturally, you can make the extension that it's also going to be nice for, let's say, streaming um, games via, for example, Steam, or even just watching movies or what have you. So it's going to be a pretty nice card. I don't know how it's going to compete against the RX 460 because obviously we're not seeing full benchmarks, but I do feel that the RX 460 honestly was a little bit underpowered. The RX 470 is in my opinion a really good card unfortunately what's scuppering the rx 470 from a lot of people's recommendations including my own is that retailers are often price gouging on it if that card was let's for example say about 10 to 20 pounds or your regional equivalent cheaper then that card would be an absolute phenomenal buy as it is the rx 480 is pretty much running away with the show with the uh, polaris lineup as it is but as a slight side. Now, Kaby Lake. So, I'm pretty certain everyone and their mother who's watched this channel regularly knows what Kaby Lake is, but for the three or four folks who may be new or um, haven't heard of it by this point, then it is, of course, the successor to Skylake, which is, of course, Intel's current um, mainstream processors. So there are a series of leaks which primarily concern images of the processor, although they're not exactly amazing to look at in terms of the actual chip, because ultimately you weren't really expecting it to have photos of boobies on it. But what we do have is some images as well of the actual process on the desktop. So let's go through these, shall we? As I said, these are from Chinese sources, which is unsurprising given most of these types of leaks do start to appear as they're going through this supply chain or testing or what have you. Now, as you all know, currently the 100 series boards already have BIOS updates available. Not all of them, but quite a, a number of them. And this is really important because, of course, as the 7000 series CPUs start to emerge, it gives you a good viable uh, upgrade route if you've, for example, got a low-end Skylake CPU on a 100 series board and you decide to, let's say, jump to a 7700K. So, it's going down the stack. The flagship model is going to be the 7700K, as you're probably aware. 
and four cores, eight threads, 91 watts TDP. What we do have images for, however, is the 7600K. Now, it's exactly the same thing apart from it has slightly less level three cache. It has just six megabytes, so some of it is disabled. And naturally, it has no hyper threading, um, which is kind of a shame. Clock speeds are also slightly lower with the CPU C shot that it does actually turbo all the way up to 4.2 gigahertz, it looks like, which is quite nice. And obviously, that multiplier will go up and down based upon the workload. This means that we're looking at the chip starting to get past the engineering phase and we're starting to see actual early retail silicon. Similarly, we also have the i3, excuse my chair, 7300. Now this is exactly how you would once again anticipate the chip to be. Two cores, but hyper threading, so four threads total. And it can run up to 4000 megahertz, obviously, depending on workloads of the chip, assuming you've got those power saving features enabled. Now, this chip should be pretty interesting because it does have four megabytes of level three cache. And I do suspect that if it's priced at a competitive uh, number, depending on what AMD are doing, of course, with Zen, we could definitely start seeing the CPU be pretty popular because, well, Obviously, it's going to depend on IPC versus Zen in terms of the core. So, for example, if certain games don't use a lot of uh, threads and Zen is slower in terms of clock speeds than, let's say, or rather IPC than KB, then it could well be very competitive for the low end crowd, something like the i3. And one can make a very good argument that the 6000 series Skylake is actually for the i3 is not bad. Personally, I would rather go, and this is my personal taste, go with something like the 8350 from AMD, if you're especially cheaper, but um, or even the i5, because I don't necessarily feel comfortable gaming in an i3, because you never know what's going to happen at a drop of a hat from developers. But even so, it's quite nice, um, to say the least. And then finally, I figure it's worth to at least worthy to discuss the T-Series. So T means low power. The primary way they've cut the power consumption is a pretty obvious one. They've throttled the maximum clock speed of the chips. So this means, for the sake of argument, the um, chips might run with the 7500T at, at maximum like 3 gigahertz, 3100 megahertz, which invariably means that it's not going to be for bleeding edge gamers or power users but for small form back to PCs all-in-one desktops that type of thing where power every last watt does mean a difference then I can understand why they would go with this obviously this is probably not going to be particularly interesting for the average user and that's why I'm just quickly skipping over that uh, for the sake of this channel anyway but with the stuff covered hopefully you've enjoyed the video i'm gonna get going take care of yourselves bye for now